you have your Bibles, turn with me to Genesis chapter 32. Genesis chapter 32 will be where we start off this morning. I'm very excited about an upcoming sermon series that's going to start next week. So we didn't want to start on Labor Day weekend, but I'm glad you're here. But I do want you to come back next week. It's entitled Life in Community. And if that sounds familiar, it is one of our core values. This will be the third of our seven core values from our journey series that we're going to, we've already introduced it, but now I want to go back and kind of break it down a little bit. And so not only are we going to be talking about the what and, and the why of church, we want to kind of get in and see what exactly did God have in mind? What exactly did he hope for us that we would live an authentic community with one another? So I hope you'll make plans to join us starting next week. And, and certainly a big part of our community is what we experience in here. But another big part of our community is when we get into smaller groups. And so that's kind of a, a segue to tell you that now is the time to sign up for small groups. Uh, we have roughly a little over half of our congregation goes to a small group and has been blessed through that. We'd love to have more. So if you haven't tried one of these, let me give you a few. There are plenty in there to, to check out, but I'm going to highlight a few. Uh, two of our new members, Cabot, Megan Cooper, have agreed to host a group at, at their house. And it's going to be here in, in South Huntsville. And it's hitting one of our target demographics that's just exploding, which is our young families. Uh, another new couple, new family to Twickenham is Rich and Susan Diefenbach. And they have partnered with Roger and Terry Harwell to host a group out in Madison. We've also got four ladies groups. We've got a men's lunch group. And just a really cool uh, special interest group that we have, Kyle and Jesse Officer have put together a child care and date night group. The idea is over the course of the year, you'll watch the kids a couple of times, and the rest of the time, you've got built-in date nights uh, without the, the added cost of, of having uh, to pay a babysitter. So everyone will be happy except our middle school girls, and they're going to be boycotting this group. But... Uh, please uh, take advantage of this great idea. Also want to mention that I got a, an email from Kyle this week. He was baptized uh, on Wednesday. So we're excited to have Kyle here as a new brother in faith and, and so excited about his relationship with Jesus and his bold declaration. The Holy Trinity Church in Hastings, England uh, got an interesting parcel a couple of weeks ago. And the priest there opened it up, and it was a little over 200-year-old Bible that had been wrapped up and sent to the church. Apparently, this Bible had been stolen by a German man back in 1971. And the letter that accompanied the Bible, he explained that he and his wife had traveled all the way to Hastings to take a, an English training course offered by the church where the instructor would use the Bible to help teach England, English. And so they traveled all the way to Hastings, and they had taken a week off for this, and apparently the instructor was an older gentleman, and in the letter it said he had absolutely no teaching skills whatsoever, and they're down in this dark dungeon, you know, down in the basement taking this class. And as they went throughout the week, they decided it was a complete waste of time and their money. And so the husband, as compensation for losing this time and money of traveling to Hastings, steals this Bible. Well, in the letter, he explains that for 42 years, every time he would come across this Bible, this wave of guilt would just kind of pour over him. And his conscience, it just proved to be too much. Here's what he said in the letter. He says, now that I'm older and retired, I want to make a final impulse to set things right and clear my conscience. I deeply regret what I did and can only hope this Bible finds its rightful home again. Translation, my days are numbered. I know I've got a conversation that's going to take place between me and God, and I don't want that conversation to start off with, Let's talk about that Bible from Holy Trinity Church. In the days I have left, I want to clean some things up to put myself in a better position before God. And that's kind of a common way that the people approach their relationship with God is I've got to somehow be better than the guy next to me. Perhaps you, you've heard the, the old story of, of the two buddies that are out walking in the woods and about 100 yards off, 
uh, in, in, in the open area there, they see a bear, and the bear is coming towards them, and the bear sees them. So instead of just running, the guy takes off his backpack. You've heard this. And he undoes his, his hiking boots. He puts on his, his running shoes. His buddy says, what are you doing? You can't outrun the bear. And he goes, I don't have to outrun the bear. I just have to outrun you. And so that's kind of a, our approach sometimes with our theology and, and our response to God is, I don't have to be perfect. I don't have to be righteous. I don't have to be holy. I just could be better than the guy next to me in the cubicle than the gal down the street. And so it's all about positioning ourselves in a way that God sees us in a favorable light. So that's what we're going to look at this morning. This whole idea of positioning versus pursuing God. Let's read together in Genesis chapter 32, starting in verse 22, about a gentleman named Jacob that knew all too well about this positioning. That night, Jacob got up took his two wives and his two maidservants, his eleven sons, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions. So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, uh, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched, and he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go for a stay break. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. And the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with man and have overcome. Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask my name? And then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Penel saying is because I saw God face to face and yet my life was spared. The sun rose above him and he, as he passed Penel and he was limping because of his hip. Kind of an interesting story, isn't it? I mean, what, how do you get your arms around this? I mean, you start thinking about this and, and what Jacob is going through and he has this whole deal and it, was this a dream or is this something he actually experienced? Well, Jacob had been told by, apparently by his father, Isaac, and his grandfather. Who was his grandfather? Starts with A. Abraham, that's right. And he had been told by these guys that you can't see God and live. And, and certainly if you're going to have an encounter with God, you're not going to live to tell about it. And so that's the perception that he has. But yet he has this wrestling match with God. And isn't it interesting that the people of God have an understanding that they can't have an experience with God and survive? But here we go. I guess we can survive it. Jacob's proof here. So just before the sun comes up, he thinks to himself, wow, that was incredible. And in fact, it was so incredible, I'm going to have to rename this land where all this took place. I imagine he's just kind of laying there. His hip is hurting, and he's like, that was an incredible experience. No one's going to believe it. But I've got to rename this area because something special happened here. I experienced God face to face, and I'm walking away. Of course, I'm limping a little bit, but that was awesome. You know, I think sometimes when we think about God and our relationship with Him, we have to be careful, don't we? I mean, sometimes we have preconceived notions but what that's supposed to look like. And, and sometimes those notions come from well-intentioned people that have passed down what their experience or their lack of experience. And so when we hear of things taking place and people sharing, you wouldn't believe what God did, we kind of take a step back and say, well, that couldn't have been of God. You must have been dreaming that because I haven't experienced it. And the person that taught me about God, they hadn't experienced that. I think we have to remain flexible when it comes to our understandings as to how God operates. Because I, I think sometimes I'm, I'm guilty of hearing things and taking a step back and say, that, well, that can't be from God because it, it, it just hadn't happened to me. But we look here at Jacob and what, what he experienced, that wasn't on his radar. And we see all throughout Scripture that every time that well-meaning people try to put God into a box that they're comfortable with, God it seems to have a way of kind of climbing out and saying, oh yeah, well, let's re-talk about that. Oh, okay, well, maybe God is this way. Maybe God does think that. 
because I have a new experience here. And so when we get back to the story, what is old Jacob up to? Why is he down by this stream? What's kind of going on? Well, if you go back, the first part of Genesis chapter 32, we see that he's preparing to meet his brother Esau. Now, he and his brother Esau aren't exactly on the best terms. In fact, Esau promised to kill him the next time he was going to see him. Apparently, Jacob has been kind of a thorn in his flesh. And now that day of reckoning is about to happen. And, and the text tells us that Esau has found him, and he's got 400 men, trained fighters, in his posse. And that rumble is heading towards Jacob and his family. So that's what, what's going on here. So he's scared to death. So what does Jacob do? Well, he sends over first gifts towards Esau, but then he starts lining up his, his family in reverse order as to who's important. So those that are, he doesn't love as much, he puts out front, uh, hoping, well, if he's got to kill some, he'll kill those. And, and by the way, if, if you want to know where you rank, you know, we always joke, you know, well, you were mom's favorite or something. Here's how you know. If you're ever on an airplane and the oxygen masks come on, they tell you to put it on yours. But the one that they put the oxygen mask on next, that's their favorite. So these were the, the people up front after they, they put all oxygen masks on everyone else. These are the ones that do it. So he puts them up front. So you almost see like a parade. And the big crescendo is Jacob at the very back. What is he doing? He's positioning himself in order to receive the best possible outcome that he thinks in his mind. Well, that's kind of what he's doing. And that's what he's been up to. So I think we start looking at his life and say, well, this is an aberration. He's been doing this from the very beginning. You know, even coming out of the womb, he's like, I don't want to come out, but as long as I'm coming out, I'm going to come out under my terms. What was he doing? He was grabbing a hold of his, his brother's heel. He was grabbing a hold of it. And from there on, we know that there's going to be tension. His mom is very worried about these two nations that are warring within her womb. And so this happens and he says, man, I'm, I'm going to do this. And as a young man, we see that he positions himself to trick his brother out of his birthright. And he tricks his father a few years later out of the blessing that was intended for Esau. Well, he has a plea for his life and he goes to his, his uncle Laban's house. And what does he do while he's there? He positions himself in such a way to gain as much wealth at the expense of his uncle as possible. And now as he's preparing Esau... He says, I want to position things and line them up so it works out in my favor. Well, surviving the reunion with Esau, unfortunately, Jacob's positioning doesn't stop there. Turn over to Genesis 35 and verse 1. Genesis 35 and verse 1. We're going to see that he's going to do some positioning with God. Then God said to Jacob, go up to Bethel and settle there. Build an altar there to God who appeared to you when you're fleeing from your brother Esau. Now, this is also the spot where he's had another encounter with the whole uh, ladder going up to heaven. And remember, the angels are, are coming down and all that. All this is happening. So it's a very special place. He says, I want you to go and set up this altar. And we're going to have this covenant. It's going to be passed down to you. It's going to be a big experience here. So he receives this invitation to encounter God the third time. So he's like, okay, this is a big deal. Uh, last two times, I didn't see it coming. This time, I'm going to be ready. God's not going to take me off guard. He told me this is going to happen, so I'm going to get ready. So let's see what he does. Genesis 35 and verse 2. So Jacob said to his household, and to all who were with him, get rid of the foreign gods you have with you. Before he sees, purify yourselves and change your clothes. We're going to experience God. Notice the three things. He's been carrying foreign gods. Why? I don't know. He, he's been doing things that make himself unclean. And apparently they've been wearing clothes that they shouldn't be wearing. I mean, these folks are one step away from dancing with large teddy bears. I mean, they're just off the charts. They are doing some things they're not supposed to be doing. My question is, why are they doing these things in the first place? They're God's chosen 
people. And they're like, now we're going to experience God's. So we've got to clean up our act. If you shouldn't be doing them when you face God, you shouldn't have these things at all. What if your doctor called you and said, hey, you know, we kind of ran some routine blood work and stuff. Well, there's some stuff that came back. You've got one month to live. What'd you do? You know, he said, there's no more treatment options. There's nothing. You've got one month. What would be your next move? Some would say, well, I'd go back to the house and I'd, I'd kind of wipe the hard drive clean. Someone else is like, well, I've got some debts that I've been needing to pay off. I've got some books I need to settle up with. Another person says, well, first thing I do is I break off an inappropriate relationship that's been going on for far too long. Someone says, well, if I knew I was going to meet God, I'd spend more time praying with Him and, 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 and reading His Word. Well, then real quickly... Why are we not doing those things now? If we know that there's some stuff that we need to get rid of, why are we holding on to those to get rid of them at a later date? Why are we getting rid of those things now? Well, here's kind of the, the deal. You're going to meet God. Why do you wait and ditch them till the last minute? Don McLaughlin said this out of Pepperdine. He said it's like, robbers throwing money out of the car on the freeway while they've got police cars behind them. It's too late then. It's too late. Jacob has, has been out on this big wide ocean and he knows he's coming into God's port. And so what does he do? While he's still outside of, of, of the waterways of the port, he starts jettisoning his cargo. Some things he doesn't want God to find upon inspection when he pulls in and docks. He says, we've got to get rid of these things. We've got to get rid of them. I've got some mess to clean up. How many of this morning have got some stuff going on in your lives that would not work out if you were going to have a face-to-face -face meeting with God? You're like, man, it's just not going to work. I've got to, get, I've got to clean myself up. Or as Augustine, his approach was, he encouraged people to wait till the 11th hour. Do you think your life's almost over? Then get baptized. Why? Because at that point, you can present yourself as clean before God. You have waited to get rid of all this in your life to the last minute. You come in squeaky clean to present yourself to God. Is that the approach that we want to follow? That's what Jacob's doing here. Let's read on. Genesis 35 and verse 3. Then come, let us go up to Bethel. This is what he's telling his family. Where I will build an altar to God who answered me in the day of my distress and who has been with me wherever I have gone. So they gave Jacob all their foreign gods and had the rings in their ears and Jacob buried them under the oak at Shechem. Then they set out and the terror of God fell upon the towns all around them so no one pursued them. They're on a, message, a, a mission from God. Jacob. And all the people with him came to Luz, that is Bethel, in the land of Canaan. There he built an altar and he called the place El Bethel because it was there that God revealed himself to him when he was fleeing from his brother. Bethel to build an altar to the best God ever. This is the God that's been with me through thick and thin. This is the one who has been there wherever I go. So here's the plan. I'm going to start walking towards God. And while I have him distracted, you guys quickly go over to the big tree, hide behind the trunk, dig a hole, put all the stuff in we're not supposed to have, cover it up, and then join me in God as we stroll towards Bethel. That's the plan. But he's just said... This is God that's been with me wherever I go. Does this make sense? If you've had that stuff with you the whole time, and he's been with you the whole time, then what does that tell you about God's perspective of you and your walk with him? Because you, you don't come to, to him after you clean up your mess to face God. He comes along beside us and experiences life now, wherever we are, God wants to join us now. He's going to be with you like the thief on the cross, right next to you. 
He's going to be with us like Saul in the midst of his persecuting, killing Christians. He encounters him on the road to Damascus. Saul doesn't have his conversion and and his baptism and then say, God, come say, okay, now I'm ready to talk with you. He comes to him in the middle of it. The woman caught in the act of adultery. Jesus was there right beside her, riding in the dirt. He's there in the midst of the mass. That's the God that we worship. He walks with you right now. He's with each one of us with every click of the computer, every deal that we make, everything you put on your taxes or don't put on your taxes. He walks with you in the midst of all of this. Genesis 35 and 10 says this, God said to him, your name is Jacob, but you will no longer be called Jacob because your name is going to be Israel. So he named him Israel. So God's servant goes from Jacob, which means heel grabber or supplanter, the one who deceives, to be the positioner, as we're calling him, to Israel, which means, look down here, it's in the footnotes, struggler. Can you imagine all the names that he could have called Jacob? I mean, could he have not called him warrior, conqueror, victor? Now I'm going to call you a struggler. I'm going to rename you. We've done this whole positioning thing for a while and and this whole deceiving both man and trying to deceive me. Can we get beyond that and just call ourselves strugglers? That's what he's offering him. Of all the names, he says, I'm just going to call you struggler. Not just Jacob. Genesis 35 verse 11 says this. God said to him, I am God Almighty, be fruitful and increase in number. A nation and a community of nations will come from you, and kings will come from your body. The land I gave to Abraham and to Isaac I also give to you, and I will give you this land to your descendants after you. It's not just you that's going to be called Israel. I'm going to create a whole bunch of strugglers. That's what I want my people to be known as is God's strugglers, the families that are wrestling with God and who he is and trying to figure that out. He promises a whole mess of strugglers. What does that say about God and his willingness to name us that as as to where we are in our process with him? Isn't it interesting that the whole story of Cornelius and his calling came from his prayers long before he heard the story of Jesus. He just knows something's wrong. and I've been trying to do some good things and, and praying, but Lord, there, there's got to be something else. Yes, there is. Long before he hears the gospel message, he even sends an angel to him and says, Lord has heard your prayers. You don't know Jesus and it's coming, but the Lord is listening to you right now. Isn't it interesting that God engaged Saul right in the big middle of his mess? He's killing Christians on the road to Damascus. What what about the the, the woman at the well? The the woman whose life was just a complete mess and her marriages, multiple, 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 are just falling apart. Her social life is a complete disaster. But yet she's heard the message about a Messiah coming and she's waiting for that. And God says, I'm going to honor that. He's coming. He's going to have an encounter with you at this well. God jumps in where we are. How can we read all these stories and walk away with the notion that God wants nothing to do with us until we clean up our act? It's just not so. He's not calling us to put on our Sunday best and to present ourselves as righteous or more righteous than our neighbors next door to us. God says, I want some of my terms. And here's the terms. I want us to be engaged in a relationship I don't want it to be awkward. I don't want you to have to hide things from it. I just want it to be real between us. That's what I'm calling. I'm the almighty God. You're a major league struggler. Let's get that out on the table. I know who you are, created you. But I want us to be together. I don't want us to have this distance. You know, each of us will engage God at some point. And we know that. I had an uncle that used to call, uh, used to say, I've got an appointment with God coming up. We, we know what that is. But in the meantime, we've got school. We've got a career to build. We've got to save for retirement. Oh, the grandkids are, are a mess. And, and all this stuff in life seems to take priority over answering this question, who is God and how do we relate with him? What was Jacob doing? He was running away from family problems. He was going building wealth. He was having this family and and all the struggles that went on with that. And God says, 
hold on, I'm gonna, I'm gonna wrestle you. I'm gonna wrestle you to the ground until we can have this conversation. And some of you have been there in life where God's had to pin you down to get you to stop and ask about these big questions in life as to who he is and how we respond to it. God has a way of waking us up. And I, we know at some point we're gonna be six feet under and we will deal with that question for sure then, but God said, I would rather have that conversation now. I want that relationship now. Think of it like a marriage. It's a relationship that we commit to, but once we commit to it, it's a lifelong journey getting to know one, about, one another better and, and communing and committing to working on it. Genesis 35 and verse 13, then God went up from him at that place where he had talked with him. Jacob set up a stone pillar at the place where God had talked with him and poured out a drink offering on it. He also poured oil on it, and Jacob called that place where God had talked with him, Bethel. Three times in this text, it says God talked with him here. God talked with him here. God talked with him here. So this encounter with God is a, is a conversation. It's a relationship. And we admit that we're strugglers. He's called us. He's named us that. We're his chosen people. We're called to struggle with him and to talk. That's what he wants not for us to try to craft some way for ourselves to be better so we look better before God. How does this play out in our lives? 1766, John Wesley said this, orthodoxy or right opinion is at best a very slender part of religion. Though right tempers cannot subsist without right opinions, yet right opinions may subsist without right tempers. There may be a right opinion of God without either love or one right temper towards him. Satan is proof of this. What Wesley is saying here is there can be right orthodoxy, a right understanding of God, but that is a very slender part of religion. Unfortunately, we've grown up where it's a very fat part of our religion. We value right opinions. We value doing things with correct doctrine and correct orthodoxy. We believe in right practices and right worship because we know deep down, if we do things right, somehow it's going to position us ahead of others that don't. We know that there are seven churches meeting at the same time, lifting up praise to God just on this road. And we think that if we do things right and correct, God's gonna turn up the volume on this church and turn it down on someone else. That's a way of positioning ourselves. If we can get it right and get it correct, no matter where our heart is, we have a leg up on the competition. We look at Genesis 35, and I'm sure some, I, I did it when I was reading through this, going, well, if it was God that was wrestling with him, why couldn't God overpower him? Could it have been God or could it have been one of his angels? And so what did I do for, for Monday? I went through every commentary going back through, what was it an angel or was it God? Was it? And we're going back and forth. Oh, I'll read some online blogs. Why? Because I don't need to sell it in my mind in case anyone after church comes up and says, well, was it God or was it an angel? That's not the point of the passage. The point of the passage is, was God cared so much about Jacob, he wanted to stop his life and track and have a conversation with him. He wanted to be so close to him that he was eye to eye. He was face to face. He was heart to heart. He was flesh on flesh saying, Jacob, this is how close I want to be with you. That's the point of the passage. The point is God wants to be so close to each one of us that it seems that awkward. He wants us to be eye to eye with him. He wants us to be heart to heart and he wants us to have flesh on flesh with our heavenly father. Oh Lord, I'm not ready for that. You don't know about the sin in my life. God says, are you kidding me? I'm the God that's been with you wherever you go. I know all the ins and outs. I've watched you walk around with your idols. I've been with you when you've had impure acts. I, I've seen even some of the clothes that you've wear. I, if you stop and just stay with me, I'll begin the process of healing you. And I warn you, it's gonna take a long time. It's not a one act thing. It's a lifelong journey. 
And that healing is not going to be completed until you're with me for all of eternity. But I want you to start wrestling with that now. I want you to start struggling with with who I am and who I'm supposed to be. Here's the heart of the message. God is seeking engagement. It's what he wants from us. We cannot position ourselves by anything we can do. The only way that we can position ourselves, God has to position ourselves to make us ready to be presented before the living God. And he did that through his son, Jesus Christ. That's how we have opportunity to come in. The rest is just fruitless pursuing and posturing. Whatever name that you brought in this morning, and a lot of times we have negative names that that we think of ourselves and and we look in the mirror. God says, I want you to take that name and let's put that aside. That may be the name that you've given yourself. I've got a new name. Your name is Israel. You're going to be a struggler. And I specialize in struggler. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, it's easy for us to have a faith that's God plus. Lord, we've got idols in our life. God plus undiscerning spiritualism. God plus unbridled materialism. God plus self-promoting success and so on it goes. Lord, forgive us. Lord, also forgive us for the ways that we share our loyalty Forgive us of the idols, even when those idols include pride and how we do church. Lord, help us to admit it that we are no more than simple strugglers that desperately need you. Thank you for your son, Jesus, that allows us access into your throne room where we can struggle. Come alongside us, Lord. Make us whole. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You know, in that part of the article that I read, the thing that was most sad to me is that gentleman that has stolen the Bible, is that for the better part of this man's life, for 42 years, he's had this nagging feeling deep inside that something just wasn't right. That he wasn't right with God and he wasn't going to be right with God and he felt until he shipped this thing off. You know, how many of those nights over those 42 years did he lose sleep because he's got something deep down in him that isn't working right with God? You know, this morning, I think we have the same choices that gentleman in Germany had. We can pursue a life that's filled with spiritual uneasiness, hoping that at the 11th hour, we can make things right before we go off. Or we can say, I'm not going to live that way any longer. I want to be labeled among the strugglers. I want to say, God, you know the hot mess that I am. Come at me now, Lord. I want to be eye to eye with you. I want to be heart to heart with you. And Lord, I want that flesh on flesh experience to be in right relationship with you. So this morning, that's your invitation. You can choose to remain there and kind of doing the best you can and posturing yourself. Or you can say, I'm done. I'm done with that feeling distance from God because I've got this nagginess in my heart. I want to be right with God. If we can help you this morning, if you're ready to call yourself a struggler, come now as we stand as we sing. Let us be faithful, 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 Lord. Let us be faithful.